Hey everybody, welcome to another video. Today we're going to be working on this Xbox Series S which I bought off eBay for £73.99. That's around about 90 US dollars for anyone that's not in the UK. I paid £66 for the actual console plus the shipping costs and apparently it turns on but it doesn't show anything on the screen. Hopefully it's not another SSD fault. So with that being said, if you are new to the channel and you like this type of content, I would really appreciate it if you hit subscribe and turn on the bell notifications, that way you don't miss any future videos. My name is Dakota and I'm an electronics technician. I specialise in games consoles specifically and I teach people how to do it on YouTube. So if that's something you're into, then please be sure to get subscribed. If you do want to support me as well, you can do so by checking out the links in the video description. You can become a Twitch Prime subscriber if you've got an Amazon Prime account. Absolutely free if you've got Amazon Prime, but it does massively help me out. There's also some affiliate links in the video description as well, as well as a link to my Patreon page. So with that being said, let's get into the video. Okie dokie, so like I said, I paid £66 for this, and apparently it doesn't show anything on the screen. And looking at it, I can already see why. It's got a damaged HDMI port. You probably don't give a damn about what I've got to say, but just hear me out for a minute, alright? We all know that those sweaty little douchebags with cheesy fingers, living in the mom's basement, drinking Red Bull, and simping over TikTok losers are gonna break the console. And you and I both know that you're too cheap to buy off eBay, you're too impatient to wait for AliExpress, and you're just about smart enough to avoid Amazon completely. You could admit it, because I'm exactly the same. That's why I started my online store, consolefix.shop. I'll sell every part you'll need to fix the Xbox One, Series S, Series X, PS4, PS5 and Nintendo Switch consoles. So why not give me the money instead of some random dude on eBay? At least if I have it, you know it's not going to waste on some stupid thing like promoted eBay listings or food for the kids or something. If you give me your money instead, I promise I'll use it on useful things like buying views on TikTok. So before you decide to go to one of the more popular sites and line the pockets of some fat cat loser, take a look at my online store. Check out the link in the video description or the top pin comment and get 10% off any order over £25 during checkout. Alright, now you can go back to watching this douchebag on YouTube trying to fix something. You can't say stuff like that on an average, dude. You're not my dad, dude. Don't tell me what to do. That's what you think, Phil. Wait, what? Mom? Wah, wah, wah. Alright, well, this is going to be nice and simple. I'm not going to bother turning this on. I don't want to risk causing any more damage to the console. Hopefully it hasn't taken out the HDMI encoder or the ESD IC. Uh, there we go. So while I'm taking this apart, I do want to give a little bit of a shout out to someone. So a good friend of mine, Wayne, from Get Refurbed. Used to be known as Wayne's World of Repairs, but he changed his YouTube name to his business name. Has just recently started uploading again on YouTube and his goal is to get to 8, 000, sorry, 4,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So, yeah, please help him get there by checking him out. He's going to start uploading a weekly video again. So, I highly recommend checking him out. He doesn't just focus on consoles. He does all sorts, you know, phones or anything like that. So, it would, it would be very, very helpful to him if you check him out and maybe give him a follow as well. And that is the wrong screwdriver. You should probably unsubscribe from me because I haven't got a clue what I'm doing apparently. Well, yeah, hopefully this is going to be a nice simple repair. And one thing I've already noticed about this, just without even looking, is the fact that this has already had a HDMI replacement in the past. And I noticed that without even looking. I'll show you why when I get it under the microscope. But interestingly, it looks like they didn't change the thermal paste. Naughty, naughty. Okay. So, I noticed, ah, uh, well, okay, yeah, well, that would explain why, wouldn't it? I guess it's not a simple repair after all. What the hell have they done to this? They might have even killed that ESD, I see. Oh, you did a good job consolefix.shop sells those too. <laughs> oh dear, well, it looks like we've got trace repair on our hands. You might notice a difference in the display uh, for the microscope, and that's because I have got an anti-glare uh, filter on the bottom of this now. So let me know if it's any better in the comments. Let me know if you think that it looks better. So I guess the first thing to do with this is just to get the HDMI port removed then, I guess. So 
Now I've got this hanging over the edge of the table right now. And the reason for that is because I want to heat up from underneath the board so as I don't damage any components on the top. What on earth have they done to this? Looks like we've got another line seller. That's the second one I've had tonight. All right, so I'm just heating up from underneath. I've got my hot air set at max speed. Uh, well, max heat, 480 degrees Celsius on my Atten hot air station. Uh, there's no real sensitive components under here, so I'm not really worried. There we go. All right, so the first thing I'm going to need to do then is I'm going to need to clean up these traces. I'm going to be completely honest. I've left this seller negative feedback already because there is no way the seller didn't know about a prior repair attempt. They put in the list in description, and I'll leave it up on the screen now, but they put in the list in description, possible HDMI fault. Yeah, I think this is a bit beyond that, and I'm honestly fed up with sellers doing this. They're selling stuff that they know full well what is wrong with it. I mean, I would have bought it no matter what. I actually enjoy trace repair, but the fact that the seller's lied in the description deserves negative feedback. That's what the feedback system is there for, to let other people know your experiences. And, you know, call me an ass, give me a stick in the comments, regardless, that seller, at the end of the day, that should have been honest. It's just completely unacceptable, in my opinion. So I've got to cut these traces off because we can't leave them hanging. We've got nine missing traces there. Basically every single data line. Plus pin number 15. <sighs> well, never mind. We're going to move along and stop whinging like little girls. That substance I've just added is called Flux. And that basically helps the solder to flow, prevent it from becoming oxidised and prevents dry joints as well. Even though I do use Kester solder, so there is a little bit of flux inside the solder itself. But it's not enough, especially for surface mount soldering and things like that. So first thing I need to do is just run the iron over the pins that are actually there. So I can just inspect them, make sure no more are loose. And not good. Let's just add some leady solder to the ground legs while we're here. So yeah, let me know if this image quality is any better with this filter on it. It does seem a little bit better to me. Alright, so there's some nice shiny joints on the ground legs. <laughs> there's a trace missing up there as well. And there. I mean, that's not so bad. That's just, you know, additional anchor points for extra support. So next I'll just need to clean this flux up, even though I've just put it down, because I'm going to need to grind away at the missing traces so as I can solder some new wires to them. So if I just use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol, and when I say a little bit, I mean I'm basically going to pour it on. So now we can see where we need to solder to. So we've got pin 17 and 15 missing. And then all of the data lines are also missing as well. So pin number 17 is a ground. I'm not overly fussed about that, but if I'm going to do the rest of them, I may as well do that one as well. So I'm just going to grind away with my little grinding pen. Just expose the copper underneath the conformal coating. And same with these ones here as well. Like I said, I need to restore these traces and the way I'm going to do that is by running some jumper wire from the traces themselves where they're still on the board or in, ca in the case of the ground from the ground pad and then basically just run some jumper wire to the end point which is going to be the HDMI port. So I'm going to just scrape that a little bit so as it all 
accept my solder. Just like that. Nice little blob there. And then I'm going to do the same with these data lines as well. So all of these lines here where we've got even traces, these are called differential pairs. They carry the data signals. And it's very important that we keep the trace length as close to manufacturer spec as possible. The reason for that is because if you look at the specifications for HDMI 1.4 and 2.0 etc you only have a 0.3 sorry no a 3 millimeter tolerance on trace length if you've got one trace that's for example 5 millimeters so you can have another trace 2 millimeters you can have another trace 8 millimeters does that make sense but you can't go over or under that so basically if you do you're probably going to end up with data corruption or no display at all so we're going to keep them as close to factory spec as possible because especially in this case of hdmi traces or anything micro soldering related you know it's not as much as you think it is and it's a lot less when we're talking you know magnified sizes so we're under a microscope at the minute so obviously three millimeters is going to look like a lot more than it actually is and then i just realized we're under the microscope but you still couldn't see what i did because i was off view the problem is i can see a lot more than the camera can with the optics so unfortunately if i'm not looking at my screen i don't know exactly where the camera can see kind of sucks and i'm a shitty youtuber but never mind so there's the ground leg or the ground trace run let's go for pin number 15 so like i said i do want to keep these as close to factory spec as i possibly can so i'm going to try and follow the original route if i can Okay, so what I tend to do once I've soldered the jumper wire down is I'll grab a couple of pairs of tweezers and then just position it so as it's basically sitting inside the original cavity for the trace. So just like that. So that's basically following the original route and it should prevent any kind of data loss or data corruption or any kind of signal issues. Keyword there is should. So that's basically what I'm going to do for all of these missing traces. And then hopefully at the end of it we'll have a working console. So that's sitting nicely inside its cavity there. What you'll tend to find that you have to do every so often is just reflow the flux. Just because it, it burns up and hardens as you go along. So I'll just reflow it every so often and then every so often I'll clean it as well and apply some fresh flux. Just to make sure we don't end up with any dry joints or anything like that. So I'll move on to the data lines now. Differential pairs. So I'll pre-tin the wire as much as I feel like I'll need. And I'm basically just rough oiling this if i get it wrong i can always desolder it so i'll just flow that again just to be able to see where the cavity is i'm not going to make you see through all of this by the way i'm just doing the first few and then i can fast forward through it once you know what i'm actually doing So again, 
just position that. Try and do as, better, as good of a job as possible. And then trim off the excess. I'll do one more and then I'll clean it up. I had a feeling that wasn't connected. It's okay, I can just do it again. If you find yourself struggling to hold it in position, just grab it with the tweezers if you can. All right, so we'll clean this up now. So I'll get a bit of isopropyl alcohol. I should probably trim that wire first. So when you're cleaning it, you'll probably find that the wires all come out of position. Don't worry too much, just reposition them afterwards. But you'll see now that I can see a lot better now I've cleaned up. If you want to prevent that, you can always put some conformal coating down as you go along. Or solder mask, should I say. People go nuts when I call it conformal coating. Same thing, tomato, tomato. There we go. And that is ultimately what I'm going for. So follow the same path if I can. And then hopefully it'll be pretty much back to factory spec. That's the plan anyway. So that's what I'm going to do. So before I do go any further, because I've just positioned those, I don't want to keep having to manipulate those wires. So I'm going to get a little bit of conformal coating. Sorry, solder mask. <laughs> uh, going to get a bit of solder mask. And I'm just going to protect these traces. You really don't need much here. So if I do that, when it actually comes to cleaning with the brush, it's not going to twist these wires around. So you can see this big blob on my nozzle. On the needle believe me that is tiny that's just to put into context how little you actually need of this stuff one tube will last you years i promise and no unfortunately i don't sell this on the online store i can't find it at a reasonable price where i can actually make it viable to resell okay there we go so yeah that's pretty much all you need there but like i said that's a blip so here's the actual ne uh, needle nozzle whatever you want to call it it's a tiny little blob on the end of it and you saw that i'd barely used any of it i've had this particular solder mask now for four years and yeah barely touch the sides really barely touch the sides so that's called uvh 900 and it's made by mechanic and i'm going to use a uv light to cure it all right, now, now that it's cured, I'm going to use a little bit of warm air with it as well. Then I'll just harden it a little bit more. There we go. So now you'll see that the solder mask is pretty much solid, and these wires are going nowhere. It will harden some more when I put some more solder mask down, because I'll be using the UV light again. It doesn't have to be perfect. 
But now, obviously, when I use the brush now to clean up, you know, they might twist from side to side a little bit, but they're not going to go very far. I'm not going to have to keep manipulating it back into position. So I like to just do that as I go along. And I'll probably finish these six before I put any more conformal coating down. So the, the, sorry, solder mask. I'll probably finish, the, finish these six before I put any more solder mask down anyway. So, yeah. Cue the inspirational music. A million people in the crowd, but I only see your face in all the lights. And as the bass keep pounding on me, baby, I really want to make you mine. I don't really care. I think that looks pretty good. Definitely looks uh, better than what it did, doesn't it? Uh, so we've got some nicely aligned traces there. They should all be within spec. Should be good to go. So I'll grab myself a brand new Series S HDMI port. And what I'm going to do with this, before I do anything, is I'm going to just tin the actual port legs themselves. So these pins here, these 19 pins, I'm going to pre-tin those with some solder because that'll give it as much of a chance as, po as possible of making a contact first time without me having to go back in and re-solder any pins. We're probably going to have to go back in and solder some pins anyway because, you know, they are they are jumper wires, so it makes it more difficult to get a contact first time, but sometimes we get lucky. So I'll just run the iron over them. There we go, that will do. And then with the board back over the edge of the table, I'm going to heat up again from underneath. I am going to get rid of that random stray wire though first. Get off. Get off my board. So I'm going to heat up from underneath and then just drop the port on like I would a normal port. And like I said, hopefully it makes a contact first time, but it's probably not going to. Again, I'm at 480 degrees Celsius. 
And it might help if I actually added some flux to this. I'm going to keep the airflow moving now. Push down on the port, press and hold. And wait for everything to solidify. And now I can bring it back on the table. I do have a little bit of a stray bit of solder there, but I can get rid of that. There we go. So I'm actually just going to run over them with the iron anyway. Rather than tapping on them, I'd rather just run over them with the iron, but all of those jumper wires look pretty much perfectly aligned there, so I'm happy with how that's turned out. If I just zoom in, yeah, I'm pretty happy with how that's turned out, to be honest. But like I said, I am going to just touch them up and just basically add a little bit of solder to each one. I don't like the look of the top of the pins. Don't worry too much about the bridges for now. Get rid of the excess solder off the iron. And I'm basically just going to use the drag method. And just run over these a couple of times. Clean my iron every so often as well. The pin there which is slightly out of position, let's just sort that out. So if I just give the pin itself a little bit of a nudge, it's only a ground, but if I just give it a little bit of a nudge, it should solder into place. So I'll just clean that up now, and then I can have a look on an angle. I actually see a bridge, actually. Yeah, just there. I saw it with my eyes without the microscope. I see a little bit of a reflection. There we go. So because I'm behind the actual port, instead of looking straight down, I could see a little bit clearer. Personally, I don't actually need the microscope for a lot of repairs, but obviously for trace repair I do, but for the most part, I can see pretty much everything on the board. My eyes are pretty good. I'm just gonna give that a good clean. I'm just gonna get another brush and just give it a clean from a different angle. I'm not a fan of using this brush because you tend to get stray bristles that fall off on them. This is actually a flux brush, but it's been trimmed down. My mate Vince gave me this idea, as I'm sure he gives a lot of people that idea, but yeah, it's actually a normal flux brush, which I've trimmed down. Uh, you know, just cut the, uh, the bristles down on it just to make them a little bit more rigid. It allows for better cleaning. It also allows me to get nice and far behind into the pour. I was going to say nice and deep, but then I'd have to say that's what she said. And I promised myself I wasn't going to say that's what she said today. <laughs> All right, there we go. Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. I'll just give it a final clean with a cotton swab. I've got a feeling that ground leg still isn't connected. I think it might have desoldered. And I've got the e cups as well for some reason. Yeah, I knew it would have done. Uh, that's okay. I'll sort that in a second. That one I'm not concerned about because it's the trace wires behind it. It does appear as though the rest of my jumper wires are nice and solid, though. I will test them in diode mode with the multimeter, though. But I am just going to sort out this one ground leg just because if I don't, even though it's not needed, it will bug me. So I'll just sort that out. Well, it's definitely connected now, isn't it? All right, let's have another look at that. Was it that one? I think so. 
They're all connected anyway. All right, that's good. That'll do. Ah. Still got a damn bridge. God damn it. There you go. Let's just give this a test in diode mode. What we want to do is we want to check and make sure that all of the differential pairs have got a good reading and make sure that they are all similar. So we should expect around about a 0.78 volt drop to ground on these, on the differential pairs themselves. So with red probe on ground in diode mode, uh, 0.74, yep, yeah, that's fine. My multimeter is actually set to low speed, which is really annoying. I unplugged it this afternoon. So let's just check that again. 0.74, yeah, okay. So one thing you'll notice is I'm checking on the top of the pin and not on the wire. That's connected to ground. 0.746. So the reason I'm checking on the top of the pin is because I don't want the wire itself to skew the results. 0.746, ground. 0 0.746, 0 0.746, ground, 0 0.746, whoops, I slipped there, but it, that was correct. 0 0.746, ground, uh, 0.746, yep, yeah, okay, all of those seem fine. 0.6, so the reason these ones wasn't beeping is because the voltage drop to ground is too high, but this one it's not, so it will beep. 0.6, that's fine. 0.69, that's fine. 0.60, that's fine. 0.62, that's fine. Ground. 0.59, that's fine. And 0.64, that's fine. You can actually see that, but I was just checking from left to right on those pins. I'm not going to check them again. I mean, if you've watched any of my other videos, you'll have seen it before. But all I'm doing is just checking the top of the pins in diode mode anyway. The same as what I did on the other ones. Sorry about that. But yep, yeah, that all reads fine. Let's just make sure in continuity mode that I don't have a short to ground, or rather a short from one data line to the other. So now we don't want to hear a beep. So we don't want to have a short between the positive and negative on the differential pairs. And we don't. And then let's just make sure that none of these are short to ground. Uh, actually, they're not going to be because I've just checked them um, in diode mode, so they're not going to be. So let's just make sure we don't have any more bridges on this side of the port. So again, like I said, we don't want to hear a beep here. And yep, okay, all of those are fine. Yeah, everything tests absolutely perfect there. Can't see any issues. And this should now work. What should have took me 20 to 25 minutes has now took me an hour and 25 minutes. I mean, granted, a lot of that time was left in the solder mask cure, but, you know, and also, I mean, realistically, if I wasn't filming, I could have had this done in 40 minutes, this trace repair job. I am fairly quick when it comes to trace repairs when I'm not recording a video, but obviously I like to put the video out there for people to learn. But my time is valuable, and that's what's annoying. I consider my time as valuable. And the fact that the seller... <laughs> they've either lied or they're incompetent and I can only assume that they've lied because one thing that I noticed while I was well before I left negative feedback so I'll check the description again I'll just talk about it while I'm doing this thermal paste but I'll check the description again just to make sure that I hadn't missed anything right and one thing I noticed was they are selling other faulty items or they've sold other faulty items recently so they're not new to the game i mean they've only got you know 170 something feedback but they're not new to the game and if they've got 170 something feedback then they've probably sold three four hundred items minimum and one other thing that i noticed and the deciding factor in this for me for leaving negative feedback without contacting them first was the fact that this has already been sold once now whether or not that's because someone sold it or someone's bought it and returned it i don't know but i i'm not sure um but it's already been sold once and then it's been relisted and i didn't notice that before so that is my fault but at the same time 
you should be able to trust the sellers. And quite frankly, I'm sick of not being able to. Long gone are the days when we used to actually be able to trust what people said on an eBay listing. And like I said earlier on, I would have still bought this. If it was trace damage, I probably wouldn't have paid as much. I probably would have been willing to pay, you know, 40 or 45 pounds, fair enough. But I, I still would have bought it because I do actually enjoy doing trace repair. But my problem here is the fact that I do see my time as valuable. You know, you, you, you are the only person who can put a price on your time. And to me, an hour and a half of work is worth around about £100 because that's what I would generally charge if I was doing the repair for someone else. If it took me an hour and a half, then I'd generally charge around about £100 labour, which is pretty much the going rate when it comes to micro-soldering repairs. It's specialist work and time is valuable at the end of the day. But, you know, I'm probably going to get some stick in the comments. I really don't care, <laughs> to be honest. I really do not care. At the end of the day, I feel like I've been lied to. I feel like I've been deceived. And for that reason, I left negative, co negative feedback. And I'm well within my right to do that. Right, okay. So I'm not going to fully reassemble this. I'm just going to assemble it enough just for testing, just for the sake of the video. I can reassemble it afterwards. Uh, same as the fan, I will clean it, but just, you know, I don't really need to for the sake of the video, do I? I mean, I'm sure if you've watched any repair content of mine in the past, you'd have seen me clean the fans and stuff. I do it on every device. So I'll connect everything up that I need to connect up. I really should have turned this on first. I just want to get the video finished now because it's been going on for a little bit too long. But I really should have turned it on first. Okay, there we go. And I'm going to use my HDMI tester. You can buy these on the store. These videos are just an advert at this point, by the way. Just, uh, just as a heads up, you know, these videos are just an advert for products on my online store. But no, seriously, these HDMI ports are incredible. Sorry, these HDMI testers are incredibly useful. So what this is going to do is it's going to light up all of the critical parts of the HDMI circuit that are required for a display. So I don't want to sit there and take the HDMI cable out of my uh, microscope just, you know, just to find out it's not going to display. I'm yawning now because it's 3am, 3.22am, Jesus. Alright, let's give it a test. Uh, oh, Boo to the Bugs here, by the way. He's come to say hello. That's not a real bug, by the way. Someone left a comment the other day saying, why have you got a cockroach on your desk? <laughs> it's not a real bug. It's not a real bug. All will be revealed in a future video. Okay, there we go. We have all data lines active. That's the green lights. We've got EDID, which is the blue light, and then we've got 5 volt and power, which are the red lights. So, yeah, everything appears to be working on that. So, let's give this a test using the capture card then. So, the reason I don't like doing it is because I have to unplug my microscope power lead and then plug in the capture card cable to the console. So, I don't like to unplug it unless I have to. I really do need to get another cable set up. All right, let's switch over. There we go. We've got a display. And that is what I'm talking about. All right, I'm going to sync a controller and I'm going to do a few tests. Okay, so let's see if it connects to my wireless network. It does, good. It's going to want an update. Uh, nope, that can wait. Uh, so it's picking up 4K. It's not going to work on the capture card, but it is picking up 4K. But that appears fine. So I'm going to switch over to the TV now. So I've got my TV HDMI cable plugged in. And ugly cam, let's just see if it loads up in 4K on the TV. That's working. So I guess the final thing that's left to do on this then is just to run an update and make sure that it's not banned online. And also that it's going to load a game. You're not going to get through there, cat. The window's closed. It's too cold. Oh, no. Shut up. 
kids. Who would have them? All right, I'm going to let that run through the update and then I'll log into an account or I'll log into my, my own account and make sure it's not banned online. Make sure it loads a game and then it's pretty much good to put back together and get gone, I guess. Look at the cat hiding there. I can see you, Milo. Milo. Shh, no one knows he's there. Milo. Come on, then. He's hiding behind plasterboard. Right, so that's updated. It wouldn't let me sign into the main account that's on here. It wants a password. So I'll try the other account. And if it doesn't allow me to sign into that, then I'll just sign into my own and just make sure that it actually works on uh, on Xbox Live or whatever the hell they're calling it these days. No, nah, it wants a password. All right. Okay, I'll sign into my own account then. Uh, okay, well, that appears to be working. Let's just have a look what is on there that I can actually load up. Ah, that's why this got broken. It had FIFA on it. <laughs> yeah, that explains it. Uh, no, can't actually play that. Fortnite's free. Ugh. Go away. Well, it should load the game anyway. It seems to be. Game Pass is a scam. Don't get it. Anyway, yeah, that all appears to be working fine. Uh, I can't really load any games until I download them, so... I'm just going to leave it at that. I'll factory reset it and re-download some games afterwards and give it a full test. But everything else appears to be working fine. So, yeah. I'd say I'm happy with that, but... Yeah, I'm a little bit annoyed. I've been filming for around about an hour and 45 minutes. I mean, granted, when I put the conformal coating on, I looked and I was filming for an hour and five minutes. So, realistically, with the drying time of the other conformal coating and the disassembly time and the intro time, realistically, it took me 45 minutes, but it should have been a 20-minute job. It should have been a really simple fix, and I bought it with the intention of it being a simple fix. But, unfortunately, it just goes to show that, yet again, we can't trust people on eBay. It is what it is. I actually just finished filming a video, and I was talking about, because... Basically, I've had another similar situation with a different device. Uh, I won't spoil that too much, but I was talking about the whether the seller knew or not, the omen is on the seller to know what they're selling. And like I said, regardless of whether the seller knew, it's their problem, not mine. And yes, I might get some stick in the comments for leaving negative feedback without trying to contact the seller first. But what am I going to do? I'm going to contact the seller, I'm going to moan a little bit, they're going to say, oh, we'll give you a £20 parcel discount. What's the point? What's the point in wasting another four, four or five hours going back and forth with the seller for them to offer me a £20 discount? It's pointless. And at the same time, like I said, the omen is on the seller to know what they're selling. That's the entire point of being a seller. When I sell stuff on my online store, I know exactly what I'm selling, I know exactly whether it works or not, and I know exactly what's wrong, wrong with it if I do sell it as faulty. So, yeah. Anyway, I'll stop whinging. That's going to be it for now. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you think down in the comment section down below. I will always do my best to read and reply to as many comments as I possibly can. If you do want to support me, there'll be some links in the video description as well as some affiliate links and some links to my website as well if you do want to book in a repair. So with that being said, thank you very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe, turn on the bell notifications, and give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Until next time, see you later. Bye for now.